Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is William Isaac. I'm a researcher at DeepMind, and I have the great pri privilege of being able to have a conversation with Karen Howe. Uh, Karen Howe is a Hong Kong-based reporter at the Wall Street Journal, covering China's technology industry and its impacts on society. Um, she was previously the senior editor at the MIT Tech Review, uh, covering artificial intelligence. Her work is regularly taught in universities and has earned numerous uh, congressional citations and awards, including a ASME Next Award for Journalists Under 30. Um, I would also just say Karen has done a fabulous amount of research in this field, and I'm very excited to talk to her today. Um, Karen, do you mind if we just kind of go ahead and dive right in? Let's do it. Thanks for having me, William. Okay. So I'm, I'm very curious to kind of start at the beginning. Um, it's, I'm, I'm very curious to kind of know how did you find yourself kind of moving into journalism? Um, and specifically, how did you start focusing on emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, um, specifically as your focus of your work? Yeah, I think my general origin story as a journalist is that I, um, I went to MIT for undergrad and I studied mechanical engineering, which is like totally far flung from what I do today. <laughs> um, and I thought that I would go into the, a very traditional type route. I moved to San Francisco. I joined a startup. Um, I, I was like on that path. Um, and just within that first year of being in San Francisco and working at a startup, I was really hardly confronted by um, just the the fact that the problems that i was interested in working on like longer tail problems like at the time i was actually really interested in um using technology to fight climate change like that was that was sort of the focus that i had um i was just like very much confronted by the fact that it, that this for-profit um model in silicon valley wasn't actually aligned with the development of technologies for these longer term problems and um ultimately the startup that I was part of that did have this more like sustainability driven mission just completely imploded and on, on itself. And it kind of triggered this whole reflection of mine of what should I actually do from here? Is the right path to just join another startup and sort of have this occur again? Is it to go into academia? Is it something else? And um, I kind of just <laughs> decided journalism really without like, that much forethought because i was interested in writing i loosely understand uh, understood journalism to be like a thing that you could do to write about topics yeah. that you care about and potentially adjust public conversation in a direction that helps facilitate better policies like it was just like really high level um but i yeah i i, I gave it a try and um ultimately i think the that kind of like origins origin story story so to speak um ended up informing a lot of my writing because i realized that journalism and writing about ai in particular was like a really great way to explore some of these questions that i had already been thinking about just personally on like how do we how do we build better technology and what are the incentives that we currently have um as a society within companies out, outside of companies where wherever you are plugged into within this ecosystem of technology developers um, like what incentives do you face and how does that ultimately prove technologies that we have today? Um, and so a lot of the stories that I ultimately wrote, especially at um, MIT Technology Review, were really looking at the incentives and like this misalignment of incentives and like how do we potentially try to readjust incentives towards something where the technology we built is better for society as a whole. That's very fascinating. Well, I, I must admit, I think the world is better off, uh, in my opinion, uh, that you have gone into the space. Uh, I'm sure that <laughs> sure that particular startup, uh, I'm sure it would have been world changing. But I, I think I think uh, I think we were also really greatly served uh, by that kind of like uh, kind of a shift in focus. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm very curious. So you, you kind of mentioned this role of journalism as kind of shaping the public debate and kind of having this kind of broader role in shaping the way technology is kind of like understood and approached. And so I'm kind of curious, like now that you've had some experience, you've had time and you've had a lot of impact, like how do you view the role of journalism in shaping the kind of eventual systems and artifacts that are created by, by the tech industry and, and, and that you kind of see in their impacts in society? So I think 
the way that I started viewing my role um, is very much just as providing a platform for like really high quality research that's being done by by researchers such as the ones in the fact community. Like ultimately, I'm not the one that's doing the research. I'm not the one that's producing um, like rigorous scientific content. So all I can really do is sort of bring the pieces together and amplify it. Um, and that is ultimately, and also, I guess, also do translation work. I think that's that, that's also a pretty big role for journalists is to is to connect some of the more academic ideas to the public conversation that's happening now. Um, so, in in the stories that I sort of gravitated towards, that that was sort of always the um, the driving logic, I guess, behind what I was thinking about is like what are the things that are currently being debated or discussed? What are the ideas within academia that I think could better serve that discussion? Um, and then how do I translate that and amplify it so that it ultimately, you know, is read by the right people so that we do get better, better policy moving forward. Mm, interesting. So I'm really glad you brought up this kind of like connection for research and and I guess maybe as a kind of like, uh, I guess you kind of serve in a unique role because um, as you're talking in the, in the, at the MIT Tech Review, you know, it, it as a kind of like specialty publication, it did have this unique audience. Um, do you see that 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 is kind of like a general kind of like model or do you, do you think that works for all journalism or do you think that like there is something unique about when you're speaking to technologists versus speaking to like, you know, like, you know, you know, society as a whole, right? Or, you know, mainstream society, for lack of a better term, right? When you're talking yeah. about like these kind of tech questions. Yeah, that's a really good question. I do think that MIT Technology Review was like particularly well positioned for this because I knew that our audience was the tech community. And also like a, a lot of policymakers also read our stuff because um, like specifically policymakers that were like tasked with trying to develop this tech regulation. I think they were very attentive to the work that um, Tech Review is doing. So in that sense, I every time I was writing a story, I was like very clear that my audience was filled with decision makers, which was um, uh, pretty important. Like, and so um, it sort of allowed me to be more in the weeds of like precisely what the research is and um, like what are the nuances of the ideas being discussed. Now that I'm at the journal, much more like broadly appealing publication read by a lot more people. So it's, um, there needs to be like a lot more peeling back, peeling back and distilling it to just like ultimately like the, the, the most common denominator of like, what, what do you need to know as just like a general educated smart person in the world? So it is, mm -hmm. it is different. And I think um, what I did really love about Tech Review was the ability to like, we knew it was the nerds that were coming to read us yes. <laughs> and the nerds with power. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, so I was always like, what do I need to tell these nerdy, powerful people uh, that they, how, how do I best inform them and the decisions that they need to make? Yeah. So there's a lot of threads I, I, I want to kind of come back to <laughs> on this one, but I, I think uh, one of the things I'm kind of, I'm curious about, is like like you said you know like you know in, in various roles i mean obviously you know i think you're kind of serving as a kind of uh kind of uh, providing insight to a broad range of kind of like reporters who kind of cover the tech industry but i think in general i think this point that you made about translation i think there's almost like it is this kind of like very kind of you know important dynamic between the kind of press and the research community and i wonder mm -hmm. Is there are there are there ways in which are there kind of forms of research that are more easily able to be translated out and and I think because mm -hmm. obviously you're you're you've been very skilled at doing this in many different forms of research so you know whether it's the you know kind of really technical pieces or the kind of you know socio technical kind of critique pieces and so I'm wondering you know like how like it, it, are there is are there are there ways in which researchers can make their research more translatable or be able to communicate or engage mm -hmm. with this process that you do in the press so well? Yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately, even though we are like a very 
um, or at, at Tech Review, when I was writing for like a very niche, much more technically oriented audience, like at the end of the day, the most important thing is you have to be able to connect the research to like the real world and and sort of like the things that are happening around them. So like there there were definitely times when you know I would read an interesting paper and I'd be like, that's cool, but I don't know how to really explain to a reader why it matters to them you know um and that was ultimately that that was sort of like the litmus test for deciding whether or not and so and some papers naturally lend themselves to this like uh, particularly the reason why i loved covering like socio-technical papers is because ultimately that is it, it like it is part of the paper that like this matters <laughs> to the readers yeah. so but then there were there were other times when it was like um you know, like, like there was this paper, one of the first papers that I ever covered, I remember at Tech Review was, um, it was like the award-winning paper at NIRIPS um, on ordinary differential equation, neural, neural, neural ordinary differential equation. And that was like a pretty technical paper. And it was like pretty, it, it, I, like it took me a while to kind of figure out like what exactly could I say to kind of connect the, Research and and there was actually like a, a little tidbit that I got in the interview um, with the researcher where he was like, well, "Well, this neural architecture could potentially be better for um, like time continuous data, which you know might be better for modeling patient information because patients don't necessarily go to the doctor at like a similar rhythm." And and that was sort of an I was like, "Okay, like I could give that as an example to mm -hmm. the reader to just kind of." concretize this very otherwise yeah. esoteric theoretical idea to be like yeah. this could be a way that ai could help you know with improving the processing of medical information um so there's it's it's kind of like i think researchers the way to sort of get um i guess in, improve your, your communication of your research to the public is to make that connection and i will say like some researchers are better at doing this than others and and i think the key really is to also keep a pulse on what the public conversation is and what people care about because i think the 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 pitfalls is are when um researchers researchers get a little too blur within the community and so they they sort of have a really good pulse on like what other researchers care about but that's not necessarily what like the general public cares about so um mm. yeah so okay so i'm really curious so like um there's you know almost like the inverse of the prior question right so like as you mentioned you kind of have to do the translation work and you know part of it is kind of having your finger on the pulse but we've also kind of seen i think very common in the fact community is like you know we have vendors companies who kind of make completely extraordinary claims about capabilities about what their systems can do the problems they're going to solve and it's complete snake oil so like yeah. how, like how as a journalist how do you how do you think about how do you combat the kind of tendency to build hype and how like yeah. how do you dispel that when you're when you're kind of working in a tool? I imagine you have to you have to you have to uh, confront this because you're usually the kind of gatekeeper to kind of like getting more attention more focus on a company or a particular paper or a particular technology. Yeah. Um the thing that I used to do with my other colleague who covered AI at Tech Review, um, William Heaven, we would like, if a company pitched us on an AI thing, it was like, either it's real and we should think about whether or not it's a significant step forward in like AI capabilities, or it's fake and we should think about whether to call out that it's fake. And there was like, we, I mean, we would talk about, like, there, there was definitely like, instances where we would have like extended discussions about is does the fakeness of this rise to the level where we need to start messaging about it um and and sometimes it's like one random french startup says x and we're like we're not we're not going to cover that because like that would just simply elevate their messaging to amplify their messaging far more than if we just ignored it altogether. but one thing that um actually a story that that william did that 
uh, Heaven did that I thought was really good was um, he looked at like COVID tools and their success, AI COVID tools and their success and um, how a lot of them weren't successful. And, and that was like a really great, like, okay, there's been enough noise uh, how great AI could be for COVID. Let's actually do a gut check and dial it down based on like the, the research. And that's really that's that's really fascinating because I I I I definitely think we we struggle with a similar sets of problems and and I think it's very interesting the kind of uh, I don't know the kind of different approaches of like you know there's a level of fakeness when you feel like you need to intervene <laughs> versus like yeah yeah but so so so, so I'm kind of I'm sorry okay now I want to zoom out even just a little bit so like you know like as you know like even even if the systems are real right the kind of like harms that are kind of produced, right, from like the kind of construction of these kind of large computational kind of systems, when we've seen kind mm -hmm. of work by others, like with Kate Crawford and others, who have kind of flagged these kind of like systems, these connections. And and I, I know from your recent, more recent series that you've kind of linked this back to kind of broader historical patterns. And I wanted to kind mm -hmm. of see like, you know, like, how do you how have you thought about that work? How did that kind of work come about? Um, obviously, uh, I'm kind of like self interested in this question, but no. But more seriously, I'm curious. Like, how how do you weave it together, right? Because your your research is kind of like on the kind of cutting edge questions, but the way in which you think about them kind of has these deeper historical connections. Yeah, I'm laughing because uh, it was William's research, <laughs> your research that um, allowed me to make these connections. Um, yeah, I, I, so what I was saying earlier is that like as a journalist, I ultimately, I'm not the one that's producing like original scientific, like rigorous scientific anything. Um, what I'm doing is like, I am looking for the ideas in the academic community. And then like, that's what gives me permission to actually chase down a story as a journalist, right? Like I, I can't just say that there's, um, I can't just make claims without any like scientific basis for it. So ultimately, it has to be the the research and the and the the scientific discussion that kind of drives and informs my work. And it was your paper, <laughs> Decolonial AI, um, that helped me sort of make this connection. I I've sort of been noticing in my own reporting uh, when that paper before that paper came out, just this sense that. Um, we were having like in the US this like very US centric conversation about like how AI harms people within the US. But I was I just kept thinking like there are so many things that are happening outside the US that are very much driven by Silicon Valley still. Like we keep talking about systems being implemented and not working for certain groups of people. But what about like the people that are in other countries that are training these systems? What about the people that are subjected to these systems? And it's not even like the same country that where the developers sit that then subjects them. I, it was like, I was just like thinking through all these questions and it really struck me that also there's just this, there's these huge power dynamics because obviously there are certain countries that are predisposed to have the, the wealth and the resources to grow the massive companies that then get the computational resources to do this work in the first place and then deploy it, dispatch it elsewhere. Um, and it was like, as I was like thinking about these things that your paper landed and I was like, yes, <laughs> this is exactly what I have been thinking about. And it finally like coalesced into this framework that, of thinking, thinking about it through like the lens of colonialism and like what are the ties to colonialism and once we recognize that what is the path forward to a, a so-called decolonial AI and um and so there was this moment actually when I got a little bit self-conscious of like whether or not as a journalist I should be even like waiting into this space because I was like what is the value that I actually add like I'm just going to be like repeating this paper um and like that's not necessarily doing anyone any any good. Like the paper already exists. Um, but what uh, through sort of some discussions with I, a lot of people in the fact community, actually, I was like, what what do you what do you find missing 
in the discussion or like that what's like not in your toolbox that it, that you think is in like a journalist's toolbox that like I would be able to do to add value to this conversation um and they were like well ultimately we want we, like this is the we have this like theoretical framework for building this out but we still need to substantiate it with case studies and examples and i was like okay that is something that i can do i can find people to either confirm or deny this hypothesis um and so ultimately i i kind of went about like conceiving of a series of like stories where i was like i'm gonna i i'm gonna find a person in like each corner of the world that's being affected by this and talk to them about whether or not this is actually something that they're affected by. And ultimately like the reporting just really um, substantiated what you had written about in your paper that, that, that there really is this like colonial element to the whole AI enterprise and, and we need to be shifting towards something different. So uh, that's, I mean, obviously I'm humbled by that. So, not, and I greatly appreciate that you that you know, the work uh, inspired you in that way. Um, I'm, I'm actually I'm actually curious. So, like as you mentioned, like you know, we tend to kind of deal with kind of a, a, we're a level of abstraction away from the actual on the ground cases in many instances. And so I'm, I'm I'm curious after spending time after doing this kind of work of like interacting with people who are you know deeply enmeshed in these systems um how, how do you feel like how how what was your sense of the, uh, the this the scale right does it seem more intractable less intractable than than it appears in the kind of you know written you know kind of you know academic writing right and except you mentioned that you know the hope is to have uh systems that do not possess these these qualities that re, that resist these yeah. legacies so I'm, I'm curious like when you're up close and personal with it like how do you how did how did how did it change your perception of, of the kind of academic work i i was like pretty surprised by how much the reporting kind of really substantiated like sometimes like you go as a journalist like we we also sort of have like hypotheses going into stories of like how we think things are going to play out and usually like something happens along the way where you're like oh there's something happens it's a little bit different than what i thought i was like pretty startled at like how similarly the reporting kind of just like played out with what was the research community has been talking about i mean like i so I, the hypothesis that I started with was like I can f even find a person <laughs> in like any place on Earth that's probably been affected by AI. You know that that is a and like I was like that's probably not going to be true. But then like I was like in the mountains in Colombia and like talking with this woman who is like a Venezuelan migrant who literally her entire life is like orchestrated around labeling uh working for data labeling a uh, data labeling platform that itself uses algorithms to dictate when she should work when she should eat when she should sleep when she should take walks outside like it was it was like in that moment i was like this is this goes so many layers deep um like i mean she was she was like telling me these details about how because these like data labeling platforms don't it, she's a contractor she's not full time she can't guarantee um, healthcare. She can't guarantee when the work happens. She literally would um, turn up the volume on her laptop, and it would. She would. She had all these like plugins that were like from the data labeling community, mm -hmm. where they would like install these plugins, and then uh, the plugin would like automatically detect when a task appeared, and then it would give this like really loud alarm. And she would wake up at like three a.m. in the morning from the alarm ringing to like do the task because if she didn't do the task, she wasn't gonna like get the money for the week. And it's just like that level of, and, and then in the context of the fact that she's a Venezuelan uh, migrant, there's this like huge Venezuelan refugee crisis happening right now because of like the economic crisis. And there are so many, I also talked with so many other like data labelers uh, in other parts of the world that are like in crisis. Um, it was just, 
it one of those moments when I was like, I, I truly don't think that people fully realize um, how intimately these, this enterprise of building AI it is changing, fundamentally changing people's lives in the ways that we don't want. That was very moving. I, I'd say, I think, I definitely think when you, when you write about it as an academic, you don't necessarily know the kind of, you know, you know the detailed stories. I think, I think that I, I, I hope anyone who works in machine learning has a chance to A, read your series and B, understand like exactly as you described this, like that, you know, the industry, it, this is the kind of like, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, the bottom floor, the ground level of a lot of this work, yeah. right? And, you know, and, and I think that goes missing sometimes because it's all kind of above a kind of a layer of computation that is very unseen. And uh, obviously to cite, you know, Mary Gray's great work on ghost work yeah. and, and writing of that, that is a great example of like, but I think this, you know, manifested, you know, in in, in, in great clarity as well. Um, so, I'm, so I'm very, I'm very fascinated. So, you know, I, I, I you know, I want to put on one side you know, like the kind of experiences or the kind of construction of AI with how people in communities view the promise of AI, right? This kind of goes merging our questions about hype and the kind of construction. You know, as you as you mentioned, or as I mentioned at the beginning, you're now based in Hong Kong and, mm -hmm. and you're now at the journal. And so I'm curious in your time in your new role, um, you've kind of had a chance to kind of, you know, find yourself looking at technology not from the lens of the kind of like North American, European, the West, you know, kind of perspective. And I'm kind of curious, do you feel like there's a gap or a difference in how like the kind of West and, you know, kind of like, you know, like broadly speaking, views technology versus how the, the technology is kind of viewed in, in Asia and in the rest of the world? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I would say that like, one of the really interesting differences um, that I've sort of felt a lot in, in reporting some of the initial stories that I'm working on with AI um, and how it's viewed in China is that there's like a much more, there's just like far greater optimism for technology in general. And there's like a lot more um, excitement attached to like what technology can do because there people have specifically in China people have sort of like the lived experience of just having the country completely transform in the last two decades because of technology at least mm -hmm. that is sort of like the, the 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 consensus narrative is that like this the, these things of like equality like very tangible quality of life improvements um where like before you know you were you were necessarily guaranteed food you weren't necessarily guaranteed education to now like people being much more educated people having um just opportunities that they would have never dreamed of 20 years ago like that's that's sort of attached to this idea of technology and so there is so much more of like an aggressive like embracing of like things like ai like i i'm i'm looking at this story right now on like how ai is uh being integrated into education i did a story about this three years ago for mit tech review as well but it, this, a lot has changed since then so i wanted to revisit that topic and you know i was like talking with a pa like parents and talking with students um and the way that like parents talk about this is it's like really it's just it's different like i imagine if i were to talk to like an american parent they would be like really worried about like the privacy concerns they would be worried about like is this the right like i don't know like a whole host of things that i think the back community is familiar with whereas like i was talking with this parent the other day and they were like my kid um since like using this like tool to help her study has gone from like never telling me her math test scores to like running home and telling me immediately what her scores are and she now like actively goes and learns math and she's like less stressed about it and she's like happier and, like ultimately that's i want her to have better grades but also be less stressed and live like a happy childhood 
Um, and it, it was, it was like sort of just like this, like, I, it was very different. Yeah. It's just a very different conversation, um, being had in that context. And so that, that struck me a lot. The other thing that struck me a lot is that, um, when it comes to technology in the context of China, like the government is also just like a really big part of the conversation. Like I think in the U S we gripe a lot about the government not being enough <laughs> of a role in technology development and like yeah. in china the government is like a huge part of uh the technology conversation and mm. in and it's sort of i i was actually just talking with um like a tech policy china tech policy watcher and she put it really well like that 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 uh that w- like what is the significance of that she was like in general like the government's approach to tech policy and tech regulation is half sweet half sour like half of it you're like oh we need more of this in general like yes we need more consumer protections and then half of it you're like oh god like this is not what we want in like a democratic society yeah um and so that's like the other context is just that Mm -hmm. um it is yeah you you are in like a very different like regulatory environment very different um political con p- political system so like ultimately the way that technology is developed and used it has very different very different implications that's so that is so fascinating okay uh the final question i'm kind of curious to pull this all together um do you think the factor search is doing enough to kind of you know you know weave in these different kind of experiences with technologies differently like you mentioned these different perspectives in the way in which governments operate the degree in which public have trust in them um because as you know as you know as the audience who's uh, in seoul now you know we there this conversation is happening globally now um and yeah. you know i you know I, the thing i'm curious about the thing i always think about is you know as researchers are we doing enough to kind of have a globally informed view um and so i'm curious you know now that you know putting these pieces together you know is the fact community doing enough to do this outreach you know should it be doing more to try to to do this as because the conversations are are happening in a much wider uh, range of countries? I don't I think there can always be more. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in the conversation, so I, I wouldn't, I, I can't speak specifically for fact because I've actually never been in person to a fact, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, which is sort of like a very sad um, fact for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but no, the pandemic made that a, the pandemic made it a little harder for everybody. <laughs> yeah, the, the the like last opportunity I had before the pandemic to actually go to an in person fact, I wasn't able to make it, and then like after that, everything the world ended. Um, but in general, when I participated in like fact adjacent, like just AI ethics, like discussions or meetings or conferences or whatever it is. Um, there is like a pretty big absence of, um, if, from like the perspective of now covering China, there is a pretty big absence of um, Chinese researchers. And I don't actually know why that, like, is it because like the Chinese researchers themselves don't want to come or is it because they're not invited? Like, I'm not actually sure what the ultimate challenge is. Um, but my sense is that that, that that connectivity needs to continue to be strengthened because what's interesting is like i hear outside of like the research community when i talk with like i don't know a general public member or like a policy person or whatever they have these like really um stereotypical notions of like what is happening in china and technology and their understanding of of tech and ai and whatever um and like one of the the tropes that i hear a lot is like oh my god china doesn't care at all about ethics that's why they're not part of these conversations Actually, when I talk with Chinese researchers, they're like very attentively following the ethics conversation in the West and keeping tabs on it and finding ways to integrate that into their uh, their their frameworks. Like there's there's you know like there is like an AI ethics framework um, that was put out by the Beijing Academy of uh, Artificial Intelligence like a couple of years ago, and it actually is like really similar to the frameworks that are being put out um in the west and <laughs> we can critique like 
what do principles ultimately mean? A lot of organizations put out principles, but it doesn't necessarily affect implementation. But I think it is a, it is still a signal of like, they are attentive to what's happening. They are trying to align with the, com the global conversation. So like, we should be more also, like, I guess the way that I would put it is Chinese um, researchers are like very well versed in what's happening in the AI world in the West. And I think if you talk to the average AI researcher in the West, they have like absolutely no idea what's happening in China. And I think um, that could be like part of leading the charge, I think, and in, in really um, changing that equation. Wow, that was a wonderful way to end it. Um, thank you so much, Tam, for taking the time and kind of uh, giving us your wisdom and, and kind of perspective. Um, I thought it was a very fascinating conversation. And hopefully, uh, I think now there'll be a Q&A session where you know, uh, folks in the audience will be able to ask you a few more questions. So I'm looking forward to seeing that as well. Um, Thanks so much, William. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to answer people's questions. <laughs>